Okay, so yeah. Um, okay, so so nice to uh, see everyone. So I am very pleased uh, to have a case session first. Complex PCI in two twenty six DCT AP virtual two thousand twenty one. So uh, I am a young Nam from Jeonnam National University Hospital <coughs> in Korea. My co chairperson is Jun Jack Chang from Taipei. Taipei. So, sorry. So I think it's, yeah. uh, we have two <laughs> <Never mind>. panelists. <coughs> we have two panelists. Uh, I choose the uh, Hiro Hata and then APM Sora Bujman. Uh, so we have six presenters. So first three presenters will be introduced by Dr. Cheng. So Dr. <coughs> Cheng, please. Okay. Uh, welcome to John. This company PCI. So here's six uh, so complicated uh, PCI cages, uh, like a chip. So we all start from the first case. That is uh, Dr. Keche Tech from Malaysia. His top is going to be PCI to LAD ISRCTO in acute anterior myocardial infarction. The last seven angioplasty for a patient with a severe three vessel disease unsuitable for KFG. Let's welcome Dr. Tech, please. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, doctors, seniors. Yeah, we can uh, hear you uh, and see you very clearly. Uh, uh, yes, uh, all right, all right. I'll start with sharing my slides. <clears throat> Let me put this up. All right. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tay from the National Heart Institute of Malaysia. And uh, today I'd like to bring you a case where we performed a PCI to a CTO-ISR LED in the setting of an acute anterior MI in a patient with a background three vessel disease who was rejected surgery. So I'd like to make a disclosure. There was no conflicts of interest. I'll start with the background of my patient. He was a 57-year-old man underlying diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, had a history of uh, ischemic heart disease at a relatively young age. 2007, he had PCI to left main LAD, as well as PCI to his left circumflex artery. That was uh, more than 10 years ago when he was in his 40s. So since then, he had recurrent admissions for unstable angina. Uh, recently, in February 2020, he was admitted to our centre. We look back at his history. He had previous stents, a 3.5 and 2.25 stent in the LED with a, uh, another two stents, 2.5 as well as 2.25 stents in the CERT, long stents altogether. And the uh, angiogram performed <coughs> in February showed an ISR of the LED stent with complete occlusion from the osteum LED onwards. There was also a severe osteo to proximal cert stent uh, ISR, <coughs> as well as an OM branch disease, which was uh, previously not there. It's a de nouveau lesion. He has a distal stent in the cert, but that was quite patent. RCA, there was also a mid RCA severe stenosis, while the LED was receiving retrogrades from the uh, cert and the PD branches. So at that time in February, I'd like to show this is the angiogram. Even the distal left main looks like there's some tapering and there is a disease as well. <clears throat> right coronary is diffusely diseased in the mid and distal part with retrogrades to the LED. So he was referred to the cardiothoracic team in view of multiple comorbids and his uh, <clears throat> syntax score was high. He was probably better to consider surgery. However, in view of poor targets, he was rejected. Unfortunately, it's not suitable for surgery. And further discussion for uh, multi-vessel PCI at that point, uh, patient opted for optimal medical therapy. So he was well for a few months, but again, he came in in September with recurrent unstable angina. So we considered multi-vessel PCI. We did a PET-FDG scan and shows that his myocardials were all viable. So uh, on the day of elective surgery, unfortunately, he developed new onset chest pain. ECG showed ST elevation V2 to V4 corresponding to a new anterior ST elevation MI. This is the ECG, that's uh, anterior MIs. His troponins were raised, he was in failure. And we repeated a coronary angiogram. It shows that there is uh, ISR corresponding to the previous angiogram. So what should we do? Do we want to proceed with the PCI to the uh, RCA? Or should we go for the CTO? We decided to proceed with the PCI to the CTO LAD. Uh, the discussion that I'll come to it later. Access was through a right femoral, unplugged catheter, and a run-through uh, wire with fine cross microcatheter. 
during the procedure, he uh, unfortunately developed uh, worsening APO requiring ventilation and inotropic support. So this is how, uh, this was the initial crossing of the LED CTO. We managed to puncture the pros, uh, proximal cap with a Gaia 2 wire. Initially Gaia 1 escalated to Gaia 2 with fine cross micro catheter. And we succeeded in crossing the CTO after a few attempts. Because it was in the stand, so we did not uh, create any other dissections or any micro channels. So after that, we exchanged back to our run through floppy. We initially tried to pass the IVUS through, but it was uh, the stenosis was too narrow, so we proceeded with pre dilatation with a 1.05 mm Rure balloon, followed by a 2.0 semi compliant balloon throughout the entire length of the ISR. And then we proceeded with IVUS, which showed the stent size corresponding to the data that we had. It's a proximal 3.25 stent, distal was 2.25, with entire length ISR. Most severe stenosis was in the proximal LED where the MLA was only 1.9. So we proceeded with further pre dilatations with high, uh, high pressure NC balloons, starting with a 2.5 at the distal lesion from distal stand all the way up to the mid, followed by 3.0, knowing that the stand was area was about 3.25. <coughs> all the way up to the proximal LED, osteo LED, and the distal left main. We did multiple high pressure pre-dilatations. Then we repeated an IVUS. IVUS shows that there is still, the stent was landing on calcified area. That was unfortunately, uh, couldn't do much about it, but they improved MLA to 6.15. Stent was well opposed. And then uh, in patient was actually in acute, uh, heart failure. So we decided that the best option now was to just establish flow uh, for life-saving purpose. So we decided to proceed with the DEB. So we used two DEBs. What first one was a 2.25 corresponding to the sense size, 35 mm, from the distal to the mid LED uh, lesion, followed by a 3.25, 35 mm DCB in the proximal LED up to the distal left main. So the patient improved. We were managed to uh, complete the procedure without further complications, and he was uh, discharged well with an echo showing good LVEF. There was no new ischemic changes, and we did a nuclear perfusion scan. LED territory was clear. There was no ischemia. However, there is residual ischemia in the CERC and the RCA, obvious from the uh, residual lesions, and we're planning for a stage PCI to those two lesions soon. So... I think it's a it's a it's not a complicated uh, procedure. However, the clinical scenario of the patient uh, that uh, brings some points of discussion, why whether we should have proceeded with a few options. Number one, would we, would we thrombolize the patient in, instead of going for an angioplasty, uh, or which vessel to do? So there was a discussion whether should we do the CERC or the RCA instead of the CTO, which is technically more challenging. However, we felt that at that time, if we were to attempt the CERC and the RCA. Um, if there's a compromise to either of these vessels, even the retrograde, which is supplying the LED territory, knowing that this is an anterior MI, uh, if those are compromised, patient would suffer further ischemia. So with the support from the RCA and the CERC supplying the retrogrades, we attempted the CTO and fortunately we managed to successfully complete the procedure. So thrombolysis is definitely an option if this happens in the out of uh, uh, trauma. Uh, angioplasty available uh, scenarios, but since it's available, this is a gold standard and we proceeded for that. So the third point would be what would happen next for the circumflex and the RCA. Definitely looks like he would require multiple multi-vessel PCI, but whether should we put stents or DEB? But this is a young gentleman, 57 years old, who had PCI in his 40s. If we put more stents, definitely he has a high risk of uh, future ISRs. So we are probably considering a more conservative DCB or DEB strategy to reduce the risk of recurrent ISRs. And unfortunately, if he does reoccur back uh, new ischemic events, we might need to consider him for bypass surgery ultimately. Okay. So in conclusion, this case illustrates the high morbidity and mortality risk in patients with severe three vessel disease who were deemed not suitable CABG, who already attempted optimal medical therapy. 
and the CTO LED ISR PCI in the setting of an LQMI successfully achieved good revascularization and we managed to reduce the risks of compromising retrograde circulations, reducing risk of further ischemia and we did achieve a successful improvement of his uh, uh, clinical condition and quality of life. Thank you. You're lucky because you can decolonize the LED CTO. Yes. If you fail, what will you do for your case? If I think if it was unsuccessful, <clears throat> we might proceed yeah. to uh, yeah. PCI of the residual, the circumflex, or the RCA, <clears throat> knowing that the circulation, <clears throat> the LED is supplied by these two vessels. So by improving yeah. the stenosis in these two, maybe we can achieve better circulation to the LED territory. Okay. Okay, any comment from other faculties? This patient is, is maybe a very good candidate for the surgery if patient's condition are very stable. Yes, uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> he was planned for surgery, but uh, the surgeons deemed that he had poor targets because he has a, dis he has a distal circumflex stent. The OM was available. Yeah. Distal RCA seemed okay, but uh, uh, if the, the operating surgeons felt that he was not suitable for surgery, so mm. so initially he was attempted on optimal medical therapy, but that didn't turn out mm. well for him. Mm. And yeah. I have one more question: that you treated with a uh, DCB for this uh, total occlusion, total occlusion of uh, cipher stent. Well, well, it in this case it seemed a very difficult decision to put the stent or. Well, complete with a uh, balloon dilatation, but in my thing is that well, in case of the instant restenosis, well, eff uh, effectiveness of the DCB is, is better compared to the CTO region. <clears throat> mm. So I guess the uh, well, possibility for the restenosis or reocclusion may be a little bit higher in this kind of the CTO after mm. the elute eluting stent. Yes, but but but. I think that this case seems a very severe calc well, calcified region within the stent. So it oh, may be, seem to be a well, stent may be under expansion, yes. even if they put another stent within within first stent. So yes. this case seems a very difficult decision. Yes, I think I agree with you, Doctor, because uh, when we look back at the first run of IVERS, the stent is uh, actually opposed on a very calcified segment in the proximal LED. Uh, we don't have too much details regarding the first DCI, but it seems like uh, it might be like, I agree, it might be an underprepared lesion. <clears throat> Still a lot of residual calcified plaque in the background. So 3.25 might not be actually the uh, accurate size. Huh? It might be bigger, it's proximal LED, you might be expecting something bigger. So if we were to put another stand within the cipher stand, I think that might compromise the LED lumen with a higher risk of re in the future. Because it seems a very atropathic for a young man like this to get recurrent ISRs. Mm. Mm. That's why we decided a DCB, okay. especially the setting. <coughs> yeah. yeah, just to establish flow. Okay, uh, thank you, Tadichi. Uh, nice case uh, because time is limited. We yeah. all shift to the second. Titles. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now we will invite uh, that uh, uh, Kenny Alpen from Malaysia. We will present the same high risk PCI in the setting AQ AML with a severe pacetopenia. And that uh, Napen, please. My name is Kogula Krishnan Kenny Alpen from the National Heart Institute, IGN, Malaysia. I'm here to present my case, high-risk percutaneous <coughs> coronary intervention in the setting of acute myeloid leukemia with severe bicytopenia. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest. There's no disclosure. So let's come to the background of the case. Uh, this is a 73 years old gentleman with an underlying bronchial asthma well controlled. He initially presented to a tertiary center uh, in 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 my uh, near my uh, capital, with the history of painless hematuria for three days. So further investigation done in the tertiary center uh, noted uh, full blood count where there's a bicytopenia 
severe anemia with thrombocytopenia. And the further follow-up picture, which was done urgently, showed marked uh, leukocytosis with predominant blast cell, almost 80%. So he was uh, referred to the uh, in-house hematologist, where they were planning uh, for uh, urgent bone marrow aspiration and trephine biopsy and for subsequent treatment. The working diagnosis at this time is acute like myeloid leukemia and you know time is essence uh, in the case of uh, acute myeloid leukemia. But unfortunately, this patient developed severe chest pain with raised cardiac enzymes in the ward while waiting for the procedure. He was diagnosed as a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and subsequently referred to my center, National Heart Institute, for further cardiac intervention. So what are the issues uh, at hand now? So we, the patient has acute myeloid leukemia. The hemoglobin was 8.5, platelet is 45, very low, with flu picture showing suggestive of acute myeloid leukemia with blast cell, and the BMAT was unfortunately pending. And now patient has non-ST elevation MI, serial ECG, which was done, showed sinus rhythm, but ST depression in the leads V2 to V6. And the TROP3 within the day one and day two suddenly raised from 243 to all the way to 2,286. And the bedside echo showed ejection fraction of 42% with anterior wall hypokinesia, but no evidence of LV clot. And uh, unfortunately, this patient also succumbs to severe pneumonia. Uh, the chest X-ray showed uh, lung consolidation. The CRP was from 17, went up to 154 within day one, day two of admission. We were worried about COVID-19, uh, so two COVID swap was done, but it was negative. Patient was initially on IV tyrosine, then we escalated to IV meropenem in view of worsening um, the septic parameters. If you look at the blood test, you can see the Weissel count from the 19 on first day of admission went up all the way to 29 on day four of admission. Hemoglobin is uh, normocytic normochromic anemia with a HB of 8.5 up to 9.4. Platelet is 45. Patient is thrombocytopenic from, from since admission. And patient also developed mild acute kidney injury from creatinine 80 went up all the way to 127. Otherwise, you can see here the top three from 2,286 when increased to 3,300 within three days of admission. Blood culture so far was still pending and as we know, blood, full blood picture already showed 80% blast cells. The chest x-ray which was done showed acute pulmonary edema with right lower zone consolidation and we had to proceed with CCT thorax in view of very severe pneumonia. Uh, our concern at the time are we dealing with a COVID-19. It showed bilateral diffuse ground glass appearance. That's the reason why we repeated the COVID swap twice, COVID-PCR which came back as negative. So now what is the approach in this case? So how did we approach? It's a multidisciplinary approach. We consulted the hematologist from the another tertiary center. We bring in our in-house nephrologist to deal with the acute kidney injury. So we proposed that uh, we, de we decided that we should start off with to have an idea what are we dealing with. Is it a case of a real uh, uh, vessel occlusion or is it because of hyperleukocytosis causing the raised cardiac troponins? So we decided to proceed with a MSCT cardiac which showed a very high calcium score 855 agatston and a moderate to severe stenosis in the proximal to mid left anterior descending artery with severe calcification and also stenosis in the mid RCA. So our high risk PCI is guided by the cardiac CT. So we also plan for a pre-procedural and intra-procedural blood product transfusion in anticipation of PCI with drug eluting stent or drug-coated balloon because we know the patient has thrombocytopenia and anemia to start off with and this patient might bleed during the procedure. And which approach should we uh, choose? Either is a radial approach or femoral approach. In this case, we chose a radial approach 
to reduce or minimize the risk of bleeding. In terms of vessel preparation, we know the information from cardiac CT showed these vessels are severely calcified. So at the back of our mind, we know there is possibility we might need to use atherectomy devices in this case, despite this patient being bicytopenic. And we also need to anticipate the risk of stent thrombosis versus bleeding due to double antiplatelet post-intervention. So after discussion with our hematologists and our senior consultants, we proceeded with the three procedural two-unit leukodepleted platelet and one unit pack cell transfuse to optimize the hemoglobin and platelet. And we discussed extensively with the family and explained to them and this procedure is going to be a very high risk PCI with high bleeding risk. So the coronary angiogram done uh, via red, uh, right radial approach with a five French optitoc catheter. You can see here the RCA dominant with a mild disease in a caudal view, the left main is normal, but there's a severe pro proximal to mid-segment stenosis in the left circumflex. And in the LAD, it's a diffusely calcified vessel, proximal all the way to mid-segment and a small diffuse distal segment. So now the plan and our strategy is to proceed with a PCI to LAD with anticipation of atherectomy device usage. So we wired down the LED with a run-through floppy wire. We managed to cross the lesion. Then we attempted to pre-dilate with a Scorflex 2015mm, but we unable to cross the most tight, tightest point in the mid-segment. So at, at, if you can see, this is the heavily calcified segment uh, in the LED. Next, uh, we decided that we have to proceed with an ad hoc orbital atrectomy using the Diamondback 360 system. So we did the first round, but we realized that it didn't manage to cross the lesion. So we, we proceeded with three, six other sequential rounds at 80K RPM. And this is the results after the first round of OAS. Now, we tried to pre-dilate again with the same Scorflex balloon, but unable to cross. Subsequently, we changed that to mini track 2012 mm at the 8 atmosphere. This time, we managed to pre dilate with the mini track, but subsequently, we were unable to uh, bring a bigger size balloon through the lesion. You can see the calcified mid segment area is still not uh, very well prepared. So, at this point, we decided this patient requires another run of OAS. So we did a rerun of Diamondback 360 OS, another five runs at 80K RPM. This time managed to prepare the vessel well with any, without any complication. Next, we were able to bring the wedge, uh, our pre dilate again with the wedge semi-compliant balloon 2510 at 10M ATM, uh, pre dilating distally all the way sequentially to proximal. Finally, uh, with this, we um, initially we tried to uh, deploy our drug coated balloon strategy uh, without using a guide extension, but we faced some difficulty. So we decided to use a guidezilla uh, for extra backup support and to deploy our DCB. We managed to deploy our DCB sequence, please, Neo 2.520 at 6 ATM at the mid segment. and another DCB 3020 proximal to the previous segment. And this is the final results. You can see the vessel at the mid segment is much more uh, well dilated, even though the diagonal is slightly pinched, but the flow is good, it's still Timetry flow. We accepted the results. So now coming to the discussion, uh, what are we dealing with? This is a patient who has uh, acute myeloid leukemia and he requires an uh, urgent intervention. And the mode of treatment is to uh, initiate induction chemotherapy in terms of uh, intensive recess, uh, remission induction chemotherapy. 
And in acute myeloid leukemia, we understand the uh, chemotherapy will be anthracycline based, which all of us know are cardiotoxic. In this case, as the hematologist concerned, that we need to uh, optimize the cardiac status prior to the induction of chemotherapy. So our aim here is to establish flow, to minimize complication, and to transfer this patient as soon as possible to the hemato center so that they can initiate the treatment to save this patient's life. So that is our strategy. Probably if you're looking back at the angiogram, you realize the circumplex is also a severe stenosis, but we felt the LAD is a prognostic vessel and is very heavily calcified and there is the hypokinesia in the anterior wall. So we decided to proceed with the uh, PCI to the LAD. So coming back to our discussion, in this case, what could have caused the non-ST elevation MI? Firstly, I think uh, we have to consider hyperleukocytosis state in acute myeloid leukemia, which can contribute, contribute severe stenosis in coronary artery disease. Secondly, uh, we have to deal this kind of patient with a multidisciplinary approach with a careful planning which is critical for good outcome because this patient has bicytopenia, can develop blast crisis at any point and die due to cardiac uh, mortalities. And uh, secondly, we must understand that uh, imaging modality, namely cardiac CT, cardiac MRI, as well as intravascular ultrasound or optical coherent tomography plays a major role in ruling out coronary artery disease and planning uh, the intervention. And it, in addition, it can also help to uh, rule out any possible extra cardiac infiltration due to the leukemic disease. And as a conclusion, um, we understand and based on our experience in this case, coronary intervention in the setting of acute myeloid leukemia with bisopenia is indeed challenging. Atratomy devices should be considered in heavily calcified lesion, even in thrombocytic state. In this case, we use the information that we gather from the initial cardiac CT to guide us in our planning of intervention. Otherwise, another possibility is to use IVERS or OCT during the procedure. But we understand the echo in this patient in EF is 42%. We are worried about prolonged procedure, possible acute pulmonary edema during the procedure and looking with the lung infection and pulmonary edema, we wanted to minimize the time duration. That is the reason we proceed with the CT rather than IVERS during the procedure. And in, this, in such cases uh, where there's high bleeding risk, we should also consider drug-coated balloon or drug eluting stand with short DAPT would be the mainstay of intervention. In our case, we chose drug-coated balloon because we understand this patient will persistently be thrombocytopenic and might even bleed at any point of time prior for induction of chemotherapy, even if, if it's that successful. So with all that risk at mind, we chose a drug-coated balloon strategy. And finally, we must always anticipate post-intervention. This patient has high risk of bleeding as well as thrombotic risk. With that, I conclude my case sharing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, now, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Nice case. We are moved to the cases. We are invited and come from India is a uh, it's a vascular disotomy for cardiac management uh, please that uh, i am Kang. it's a it's a very good afternoon from india here and uh, uh, and thank you uh, to ttap 2021 and the esteemed moderators and panelists for giving us this opportunity to present our cases <coughs> So this will be uh, basically a comparative uh, study, basically imaging-wise, with the use of intravascular lithotripsy in calcium management in two cases, one with uh, OCT-assisted IVL and the other one is an IVIS-assisted IVL. So going directly to our first case of OCT-assisted IVL, so this was a 74-year-old male, diabetic hypertensive, had anemia due to some GI bleed previously. And uh, he's post PTCA to the LAD in 2010. He again presented to us with the unstable angina. 
so he was planned for in his ejection fractions about 50%. <laughs> he was planned for an OCT guided IBL and PDTA both to the LED and the RCA. Uh, for the uh, want of time, we will just stick to the RCA. So, uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of tram track calcification at the very outset in the angiogram out here. And that is uh, something exactly what we're talking about. So that is the tram track in between, and that is the tightest portion of the RCA. We initially thought it was going to be an easy lesion, which should yield to a non-compliant balloon. So we decided to, since it was calcific lesion, and we had the opportunity of using OCT in our lab, we decided to do our first OCT run through. And you would note here that in the tightest part, there is a lot of uh, signal poor region, which is heterogeneous. Uh, all the, the uh, borders are not very well defined, but this is this is the lumen area at the tightest part. And of course, uh, where we were seeing the tram track calcification, you can see concentric signal poor regions. It's heterogeneous, well defined borders of calcium, a lot of medial as well as superficial calcium. And this is definitely more than five millimeter in length, as you can see below also in the longitudinal axis. So this long axis view tells you that the most of the vessel was significantly calcified. And yes, of course, somewhere out here, it is extremely, uh, this is the tightest part of the lesion. And so we decided to first initially go ahead and do a, a non-compliant balloon dilatation as planned after wiring. But as you can see, there was a lot of dog boning out there. This is two to 12 non-compliant at 22 atmospheres. It just wouldn't open up. So we decided to go ahead with the IVL, that is the intravascular lithotripsy balloon, which is available in our lab. So after six cycles of 10 pulses at four atmospheres, we were able to increase the balloon to six atmospheres. And as you can see, it has definitely yielded partially. And that is the uh, view after uh, post IVL. You can very nicely see the cracks out here. So the cracks are both uh, superficial as well as the extent all the way to the medial calcification and therefore making the uh, vessel much more compliant for a stent. So we decided to go ahead and stent with a 3.5 into 28 drug eluting at 12 atmospheres. And so this is the post IVL. So very nice pictures where you can see the nice cracks in the calcium. Uh, here you can see it at two o'clock as well as at six o'clock as well as 10 and 11 o'clock. So, and the similar cracks, uh, they seem to be extending directly down to the medial calcification also. Something that we were not really a bit, uh, were able to do before we had IVL in our labs. Previously, we just had uh, rotablations. So, so 3.5 into 28 deaths at 12 atmospheres, nicely post dilated with a 3.5 balloon. And this is the final result, as you can see. So to start out, we had that tight lesion uh, that was not yielding to a balloon. We did a post IVL and you can see those very nice cracks which prepares the lesion very well and it makes the vessel far more compliant and amenable to a stent. And yes, you can see after post PCI that you have a very nice uh, round, uh, well opposed stent, which is, uh, and it has expanded very well. We quickly go to a second case. This is the IVUS assisted IVL. This is a hypertensive male uh, case of chronic kidney disease on maintenance hemodialysis presented with unstable angina and a trop I of 12. Uh, baseline labs are 12.5, and he has a creatinine at 8.4. He's totally anuric and dialysis dependent. And as you can see, you would note out here too that he has a huge uh, dominant circumflex, which is a, a very tight uh, calcific stenosis in the proximal part, uh, which is about 70 to 80%. The RC was non dominant at 60 to 70%, and there were only mild plaques in the LED. So that is the initial IVUS run from the uh, circ uh, into the left main. And as you can see out here in the tightest parts, you can see there's a lot of concentric calcium out here. And it extends all the way down to the mid-distal LCAX also. And again, once we tried to balloon it with a 2.5 into 15 NC balloon, as you can see, there's a bit of dog pony. And as you would note out here also, that uh, the, the, the balloon just wouldn't open. And it, it was very difficult to yield in the initial part. So again, an IVL was deployed out here. Uh, so this was at four atmospheres uh, and uh, 10 pulses each deployed at uh, three cycles. And, and so this is the result after that. So let me show you. So this is at six atmospheres after, after delivering the IVL pulses. And so this is the pre-IVL. You can see this concentric calcium blocks out here with a lot of acoustic shadowing across. And this is what happens post IVL, although these cracks are not as easily appreciated as it was on the OCT, uh, but definitely there is some evidence of cracks in the calcium at the same places where the IVL was deployed. So after that, we were successfully able to deploy a 3 into 26 deaths at 11 atmospheres. And that is our final IVL, uh, that is the final IVS run, as we can see that we've got nice MLAs out here all throughout in the LCX with a very well opposed stent. 
So, and that is the final result, the final result of that circ. Let me show you that one too. So that's a very uh, well done circ with a nicely uh, opposed tint. So the idea to show this was that we have two modalities to visualize calcium. On your right hand side, you have the OCT, which definitely helps you look at not just the length of calcium, but the calcium thickness. That is the only thing that is lacking in IVIS. In fact, uh, IVIS also helps you look at the longitudinal calcium also, but not as well as OCT. So although IVIS and OCT as imaging uh, modalities are uh, well balanced, but as far as calcium thickness is concerned, uh, that is some place where OCT really uh, scores above IVIS. So the take home out here is that intravascular lithotripsy is a very new and effective mode of superficial as well as medial calcific plaque modification. It helps you know exact location of calcium. It tells you about the thickness as well as the length and the type of plaque modification device you would want to use for preparing these vessels. So after IVL, it also demonstrates that the crack in the calcium is very clearly and more so in case of OCT and gives confidence to the operator that stent deployment will be successful. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Uh, I think OCT is very important for the IBO. Any question for the panelists? So what is your criteria for the cracking the you know, sufficient calcium loading, especially in the field of the OCT? So when is your some the you know effective the calcium breaking the with the guidance of OCT and then you will perform the in the PCI. Exactly, so so I think uh, we want we would expect multiple cracks as well as we would expect if if it's significantly uh, thick calcium we would expect the cracks to be extending all the way up to the uh, medial calcification to expect uh, optimal stent deployment. So that is something that we ensure in case we do not get that we sometimes uh, redo our IVLs and give more pulses of uh, IVL shocks to that same lesion to ensure okay. that we have good stent optimal uh, uh, deployment. Okay, thank you. So because you know we are the behind the schedule, so I move to the next speaker. So right. then uh, I introduce in the first presentation a case of a successful rotational arthrectomy in a dissected and ectatic right coronary artery. The presenter uh, uh, is Siti Dalila Adna from the yes. Sultan Hospital in Malaysia. Dr. Adna, please. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Dalila from Cardiology Hospital from um, Hospital Sudan, Malaysia. So, okay. I do not have any conflict of interest. Um, my title of uh, presentation is uh, Ectatic and um, Dissected Vessels with uh, Rotational Arthrectomy. My patient is a 76-year-old Malay uh, gentleman with a cardiovascular risk factor of smoker type 2 diabetic and hypertension. He presented the diagnosis of non STEMI as he presented with sudden onset of crushing chest pain. His vital signs and uh, systemic examination was unremarkable upon presentation. Uh, the blood test, the parameters are all within the normal limits. The ECG shows mainly uh, ST segment depression at inferior dates. So, so this is the um, diagnostic categorization of the left system. We show mainly uh, osteo, um, sorry, LAD, uh, mid to distal LAD moderate disease and uh, ectatic vessels of circumflex with a CTO at OM1. This is the coronary angiography of the right system. We think this is the culprit lesion. Um, there is an ectatic calcified vessels with multiple tandem lesion from mid to proximal RCA causing a 70 to 90% stenosis. In view of this uh, lesion, uh, we decided to intervene uh, and further revascularization of RCA and we decided to put in an IVAS guided images to further guide in terms of size and uh, length of the lesion. As you can see from the uh, IVAS images, there are multiple segments of um, calcified lesions uh, also with fibro fatty plug deposition. So this is the IVUS uh, cross-section of the RCA showing a large size, ectatic size of the RCA, which measures about 6 to 6.9 uh, millimeter. Uh, the mid RCA was the tightest part. Uh, the L, uh, lumen diameter is about 3.2 and the plug burden was 59%. 
on top of that, we we'll also noted there is a part of a thin dissection at proximal to mid uh, RCA lesion as shown in this uh, IVUS images. As you can see here, there is a dissection part, there is no flap. And on top of that, you can also appreciate the uh, segments of calcified lesion as well. So what is the next plan of action? So what we have here, we encounter a calcified and dissected RCA. So we have to clearly uh, um, choose the agent for the bulky method, either rotational arthrectomy or uh, orbital arthrectomy. So we have to really be careful in this intervention in view of risk of, of further dissecting, uh, dissection propagation. So in this case, we proceed with rotational arthrectomy with careful packing at the dissected part. Um, and we put in a transvenous pacing in anticipating transition bradycardia during RC intervention. So we use a femoral approach, six French JR4, and we use a burst size of 1.75 mm. So this is the rotational arthrectomy uh, view. We, the first image is showing the packing of the dissected part, followed by further polishing from proximal to mid RCA. And this right hand side shows uh, images post um, debulking rotational arthrectomy. So we further um, proceed with uh, pre dilatation, further um, preparing the lesion with sequential uh, pre dilatation from uh, mid RCA to osseal RCA using a scoring balloon, score flex of 3.5 uh, times 15 uh, mm at 14 atmosphere. So after satisfied with the pre-dilatation and uh, lesion preparation, we proceed with the stenting of the RCA by using three uh, big size uh, stents. Uh, initially with mid, at mid RCA with onyx 4.5 at 30, followed by proximal RCA 4.526 and osteal lesion with onyx 4.5 18. And after that, we follow up with uh, post dilatation with uh, NC balloon 4.5, 15, and osteo flare at higher pressure at 20 atmosphere. So this is the final shot post rotational and post scoring um, and post tenting. Sorry. So this is a uh, IVUS post intervention showing um, uh, MSA size of 15.19 mm and also uh, reducing part burden to 38%. However, noted from here, this is the IVUS uh, images post intervention. Noted some uh, parts, uh, the stands are mild opposed and then the stand is a bit hanging. So we further proceed with uh, further dilatation at the mild opposition side. And this is the results of final intervention. The plug burden was 44%. We managed to achieve um, MLA size of 16 mm square. So as a conclusion and take home message, uh, the presence of coronary vessel dissection had been considered as a strong contraindication for rotational arthrectomy. This mainly due to concern of subintimal delivery of arthrectomy burr and resulting in further coronary perforation. So um, learning point from this case, what my experience is, we have to really careful in, in choosing the choice of our debulking agent, either rotational arthrectomy or orbital arthrectomy. In this case, we opted for rotational instead of orbital. Uh, because orbital, we feel that it will it has a spiral a movement that will further propagate the uh, dissection. And from this case, we also um, learn that careful delivery of uh, uh, avoiding any tendency for the bird to lurch forward and preventing the propagation of the dissection. And uh, of course, um, in view of um, when we uh, deal with the athletic vessels, I was guided PCI was uh, optimized and was used in this part is to confirm the dissection part 
the degree of calcification, uh, stand size, and the stand length. So from this um, case also, we showed that we managed to put in a three a big size of 4.5 stand uh, to, to the RCA, up to osteo RCA. With that, I thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the other one. So the presentation now is open for the discussion and the question. Is there any questions or comment from the panelists or some speakers? Yeah, yeah. I have a, one question. This vessel seems with a very huge diameter. Mm -hmm. So I think that well, yes. well, long term right eye may not so effective this kind of very huge vessel. <clears throat> So I think that, well, in this case, my first, first choice is a shock wave. And second choice was a, a orbital atherectomy. So why did you choose a rotorator for this case? In this case, uh, we think uh, we do not have any lithotripsy in our center. Um, and we feel at the point of time, it's a judgment call for us to do a rotor instead of or orbital. Because we feel the orbital can further propagate the, the spiral and uh, pro further propagate the dissection, which uh, already um, in the um, um, already in RCA. So we think at that point of time, uh, that's why we chose a bigger burr, 1.75 for um, atherectomy method. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Adonan, do you think it's a 1.75 burr size is sufficient to uh, modifying the classified plaque in, the, in a, this kind of ectatic coronary artery? Okay, from, um, from this case, uh, we actually uh, would like to just crack uh, the classified, but that's why we went in for uh, further pre dilatation with uh, score, scoring balloon. So, so in I addition to the... Yes, so... Uh, I think it's, this is very huge in the ectatic right coronary artery and then it's some kind of uh, some vessel diameter and then some lumen diameter is somewhat different. So how usually can you uh, calculate the, you know, op appropriate the stand size in a kind of ectatic coronary artery by the guidance of uh, intravascular sound? Sorry, I didn't get your question just now. All right, so how can you calculate your proper the stand size in a, this kind of big coronary artery the, with the guidance of IBOS? Stand size, diameter, stand diameter. Yeah, that's, um, we use the calculation from the uh, um, uh, IBOS. We, we so, estimate the size of the size and the diameter of the stand by using IBOS. Yes. So with the reference the, to the like uh, vessel diameter or some the you know, lumen diameter, how can you the, you know, calculate in the some the appropriate size of the stand? Okay. The the most denoted part was just now it's about three point nine, almost four. Um, uh, 4 mm, the lumen diameter, the stenotic part. So we um, calculate by adding another 0.5 to the lumen diameter size. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. We'll okay. move to the next speaker. Is uh, title is different strategies to achieve revascularization in inferior undilatable classific regions. The inner presenter is Shang Chu Wu yes. from the yes. Taichung Veterans <coughs> Hospital in Taiwan. Dr. Yes. Wu, please. Okay, I'll start my presentation. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm Shang Ru Wu from Taichung Veterans General Hospital from Taiwan. Uh, today I'm going to present a complex B side case entitled uh, Multi Modalities to Achieve Complete Risk Prescribation for Sequential Undiable Calcified Legions. 
Uh, this was a 90-year-old Mr. Mo who was referred from another hospital for non STEMI with cardiogenic shock. Uh, his coronary angiogram there showed triple vessel CAD with healthy calcification. Uh, we calculated his euro score to be 34% and the CINDE score to be 34.5. Uh, after a thorough discussion with uh, his family, <coughs> they chose PCI rather than bypass surgery considering his old age and extremely high surgical risk. Uh, so the next day after the mission, he underwent the coronary angiogram and uh, uh, the uh, LAD in the CAG showed the uh, uh, great toxicity and the heavy calcification with a TME2 flow. And then the second facts show uh, uh, not only a severe calcification, but also a proximal CTO region. <clears throat> uh, as for the RCA, the RCA in the CAG showed 90% uh, stenosis from the osteo to the proximal segment and also a TME2 flow. Uh, so we are now deciding to do the one vessel PCI first, considering uh, the current non STEMI, cardiogenic shock, and also acute kidney injury. And uh, it seems like the, the LAD supply a larger territory. So we decided to do the LAD PCI first. So uh, after engaging the left main coronary artery with an XB guiding caster and uh, advancing the field FC wire to the distal LAD, we try to cross the proximal LAD region with a two millimeter NC balloon but failed. Instead, uh, we plan to exchange the wire with a fine cross microcaster for the rotabulation wire, but still failed. But the uh, fine cross still failed to cross the proximal LAD either. Uh, so now we examine our toolbox for this kind of heavily calcified region, including <coughs> small balloon sequential dilation and the cutting balloon or scoring balloon and the manual tunnel devices like a tonus or tenpike gold, and the rotational or orbital accelerotomy, and the lesser accelerotomy, and then the last one, subintimal closing. And <clears throat> we, we abandoned the strategy of small balloon sequential dilation for its possible in, in, ineffective in, in this case. And uh, the lesser accelerotomy was not available in our hospital, and uh, there are still other ways to Call with region, so we do not consider the subintimal sub closing first. So for the rest three devices, <coughs> in this case, uh, we saw the cutting balloon or scoring balloon was less deliverable and uh, was possibly unable to cross the region. And also, it was very difficult for the rotor bear wiring to cross such a long torture distance. So we decided we chose the manual tun tunneling devices. And uh, in this case, as the video showed, we chose the turnpike gold microcaster and the, the turnpike gold uh, successfully crossed the proximal LED region. So after the turnpike gold use, we, <coughs> we tried the small balloon sequential dilation, including 1.2, 1.5, and 2 millimeter, 2 millimeter balloons to dilate the entire LED. However, uh, as the angiogram showed, uh, these severely calcified regions were not still fully dilated by the balloons. So uh, we proceeded to the rotabulation. We, changed, we exchanged the wire with a fine cross microcaster to the rotor wire again and uh, started rotabulation with a 1.25 and 1.5 uh, millimeter per sequentially for the proximal to the middle LAD. And here we only do the proximal to the middle LAD rotation instead of uh, uh, entire LAD, considering the following reasons, including the first one, uh, the phasal dissection did occur after the rotation, And the second one, uh, we consider the great toxicity of the vessel might cause wire bias and increased risk of wire transection or even coronary perforation. So uh, after the rotation, we use the 2.75 millimeter NC balloon to dilate the proximal region. And uh, later we use an, an Onyx 3.5 DS to deploy at the proximal to the middle AD, uh, intended to establish the proximal blood flow first. And later we use NC balloon to, uh, for post dilation of the proximal LAD instant site. Uh, the angiogram showed the proximal to the middle stand with a full expansion position. Uh, as for the mid to the distal LED region, we uh, we try to uh, uh, we try to advance our rotor bird with a six French guideliner cover coverage to cross the tortuous uh, proximal instant site, but but failed. Uh, so we we even 
try the small balloon dilation for the instant side, but the rotor bird still failed to cross the uh, a tortuous instant. So uh, here we exchange our strategy and uh, try NC balloon to dilate the middle to the distal LAD region using a 2.5 millimeter balloons. However, as the angiogram showed, uh, the severe recoil happened after the balloon dilation. <coughs> so uh, here we examine our toolbox again, in which a uh, cutting balloon or scoring balloon was our first choice. So uh, we use an NSE alpha scoring balloon to dilate the proximal uh, to dilate the middle to the distal LAD regions, reaching full expansion. And later. Uh, an Onyx DS 2.5 mm in size was deployed at the distal LAD. And uh, another 3.0 uh, uh, Onyx stand was deployed at the middle LAD, both reaching for expansion. So uh, the final LAD angiogram showed uh, full expansion of the, these three LAD stands with a TME3 flow and uh, no side branch gelling. <coughs> Later, uh, he was weaned from IBP and Inotrope six days later, and uh, he was weaned from mechanical ventilation twelve days later. Uh, so here are my here are my uh, last slide and the take home messages. It is always crucial to examine your own devices and uh, establish a toolbox for this kind of uh, undilatable heavily calcified region. And there are my six tools in my toolbox, including small balloon sequential dilation cutting balloon or square balloon, manual tolerant tunnel and devices, rotational acerectomy, uh, laser acerectomy, and then the last one, subintimal closing. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for your very beautiful uh, procedures in a very heavily classified in the LAD. So the present now is open for the Is there any questions or comments from the panelists? Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. sorry, yes. just a big problem, okay. I think the next case for the operation for heavy casual region for is the operation for LAD. Yes. Usually we will uh, we will deliver a temporary pacemaker. Uh, uh, in 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 the procedure we we did not encounter the bradycardia, so we we did not place the temporary pacemaker. But we saw if if we do RCA first, we will we will place the pacemaker first. Okay, but it is a quite a risk patient. Uh, yes. I don't know. I know you don't have the uh, resource for me, IVL, right? In your no. hospital? No. Okay. Yes. So you try the laser survey for other two catch by region uh, in the future. It, <laughs> laser uh, therapy. Laser, yes. Maybe we'll try the laser therapy. If, if, uh, 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 if, if yes. Okay. So uh, Dr. Wu, it's very yes. simple or general question. Why did you choose in the Onyx stand in a heavily classified region? <laughs> or some kind of stand in a heavily classified regions? Uh, we, 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 we do not, to, 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> we do not have too, too much comment. Yes, we, we just chose the Onyx. <laughs> uh, really? Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Usually for the casualty, we use the sick a strong stand, not a soft uh, stand. Yes. <coughs> so I think it's a, anyway, thank you very much for your wonderful procedures because, you know, with the behind the schedule, we move to the next uh, the presentation. Thank you. <coughs> the presentation, our uh, next speaker is titled is Bailout Case of Iatrogenic Left Main Coronary Artery Dissection. What should we do? The present is Naoya Yabumoto in a Hokusetsu General Hospital in Japan. The Dr. Yabumoto, please. Ah, thank you. Okay, our title, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Naoya Yabumoto uh, from Hokusetsu General Hospital in Japan. So our title is the bailout case of iatrogenic left main corner artery dissection and what, what should we do? And uh, we have discussion points. One is emergent coronary artery bypass surgery is performed for iatrogenic main coronary artery dissection as main option, as you know. 
However, even if emergent uh, cabbage is needed the more time to prepare than PCI. Uh, if the, uh, the patient's uh, hemodynamic deterioration may progress, the situation of the patient uh, would be bad. Uh, we would like to describe how to do bailout PCI for left main coronary artery dissection safely and certainly. The case was 80-year-old female. She suffered from uh, myocardial, infa myocardial infection uh, one, uh, two years ago, and we performed emergent PCI for RCA, and in this time, for following PCI and estimating a lady intermediate lesion was performed. And this is the result of it. And uh, fortunately, there was no restenosis at RCA, but there was uh, intermediate lesion at uh, LAD proximal part. So uh, we chose, uh, we added FFR study uh, to LAD, and for the result of it, uh, we deferred uh, the lesion. This is the final angiogram after we checked uh, the guiding pressure was normal, but uh, uh, LMCA dissection was uh, occurred and ex it expanded from LM trunk to LAD distal part and also uh, circumflex distal part too. And unfortunately, but the, but the pressure of the patient was still kept uh, over 100 uh, millimercury. No, so, and we created a uh, left main coronary dissection, um, iatrogenic one. Then what should we do? We have two options. One is cabbage, another one is PCI. Cabbage has, uh, is more certain uh, compared with PCI. And PCI has a benefit, that is uh, shortened time. And also we have some options uh, to uh, perform PCI like that. So we chose to uh, do bailout PCI. And firstly, we tried to uh, get advanced LAD distal part, but it failed uh, because it, uh, the wire became uh, seemed like a knuckle shape and it was uh, difficult to get advanced more distal part. So we suppose the wire was in subintima space in LAD. Then what should we do for avoiding injection and avoiding uh, progression of uh, uh, dissection, we chose to, uh, we chose IVAS guidance. And this, and uh, for the confirmation uh, of uh, LAD wire, uh, we started IVAS uh, from circumflex and we could see the wire was in subintima space, like that. And all simultaneously, we could see the dissection entry. And uh, for avoiding the entry of dissection, we used uh, double lumen microcatheter. And the key point was wiring from circumflex true lumen and beyond, uh, beyond the dissection entry. And we got advanced to LAD distal part. And it will, and we uh, we did re IVA study and confirmed like this, and we could see two wires. One is uh, in true lumen, and another one is uh, subintima lumen, like this. And for and after that, for fixing dissection entry, we deployed a, a stent to LMT, like this. After that, uh, we deployed another one uh, to LED distal part. Uh, after this procedure, uh, ST elevation was still remained, and we rechecked IVES, and it revealed a huge hematoma at stent distal part. So what should we do? Uh, then uh, we made fenestration uh, using cutting burn. Uh, we used Urbalin 3.0. At, uh, and, diff and inflated uh, 680M uh, normal pressure. And also doing deflation while simultaneously pulling back for a cutting membrane. After fenestration, uh, the size of hematoma was reduced and also ST level was completely resolved. 
This is the final angiogram using double lumen microcatheter, avoiding uh, progression of uh, dissection. And also, it took 60 minutes uh, from dissection, from making dissection, and to uh, left main trunk uh, stenting. It was really short time. Uh, seven days later, uh, after this procedure, uh, coronary CT angiogram revealed a dissection healing and optimal stent position. Take home message. PCI for left main coronary dissection has a benefit of time saving. Some, op some options should be prepared for PCI management. Four tips were performed for this case. Avoiding contrast injury, IVAS guided wiring, intentional wiring using double lumen catheter, uh, fenestration using cutting burn. And we have to, uh, for a shortcut, we have to be prepared. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. The presentation now is open for the discussion. Is there any questions or comments from the panelists? Or some moderator? Yeah, I think they're quite a challenging case. The limitation is uh, occurred to two OED and CERC. So you had the staining from the lemon to the CERC, right? Yes. And finally, how do you protect the OED? You did the uh, KBT finally. Uh, you, no. You did, I was check uh, the lemon bifurcation is still open for two big branches. Yes, two branches. Uh, after and after that procedure, we make uh, uh, we inserted a, another guide wire to uh, circumflex, yeah. and and yes. So you we, did the kitchen prong yeah. technique. The finally, KBT for the layman publication. Yes. Yes. Okay. We did. So you think that's the uh, EBU catheter to cause the layman dissection, right? And cause a spiral density for both branches. It's quite a, a challenge and a risky. So, so I think it's just a uh, moderator comment about it. What's the, the cause of the dissection? As you know, uh, maybe the catheter is really hard and it is really. Uh, and, and Jerry, it, it was really hard to engage and but the, but the pressure was normal so maybe uh, maybe the entry of the dissection was uh, near the left main trunk but sorry but I don't know why uh, the dissection was occurred so yeah okay so I think it's uh I'd like to close this session because, you know, time is behind the schedule. So I think, thank you very much for the, all the participants, especially Dr. Chang with the, with the share, the over moder moderate with me, and then also the panelists, Hirohata and then Shoropman, and then also all, all the presenters. And then we learn a lot from the, this complex um, PCI in a case session one. Thank you very much for the order participants. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. See Bye. you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.